Welcome back to our class. This will be lecture six, part one. Let's return to our discussion on the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, lo tazar, you shall not murder. And now we have a question that needs to be asked and needs to be answered. What is the decision that is required by this commandment? What is the decision that is required by this commandment? When he tells us, you shall not murder. How, then the following question, can lawlessness, how can violence and murder be eliminated from society? What can we do to make our streets and our homes safe, to feel free and to secure, and free and secure to walk about in that in neighborhood? That becomes the million dollar questions. Mm -hmm. Well, let's begin to look at this from a biblical perspective. When we're told, you shall not murder lo tassad. Number one, first of all, we must not live a life of hypocrisy. That's the first thing that has to happen. We must not live a life of hypocrisy. We must hate what is evil and cleave to what is good. We must become actively involved in stamping out violence, lawlessness, and murder. Look what the Bible tells us in the New Testament in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says this. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. For that reason, much of our entertainment is an aberration, okay, an abomination to God. And that's the reason for much of it, I'm not saying all of it, but much of it, I just simply don't participate in it. I don't even watch it anymore. Why? Because we're told not to live a life of hypocrisy. Number two, we must teach the sanctity, sanctity of life and the brotherhood of man. We don't seem to teach that anymore. In fact, we do quite the opposite. A, teach that we're all created in the image of God and that we all bear that image. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in our previous classes where we've had this discussion, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, a female, and he created female and male, he created them. And so what we have here is that we, life is so cheap today in the streets that we don't even teach the concept that we are created in the image of God. That concept is not even taught. You, you talk to young people today, you speak to old people all over the place, and they look at you and they go, whatever. I don't even comprehend that answer, whatever. I, did, I don't even comprehend it. Don't understand what it means. It makes no sense. B, teach that we are, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Are you kidding me? Today, people, more people hate each other than they love each other. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 39, we're told this, the second command, and he's talking about the commandment, what is the greatest commandment? Remember the question that I was asking? And he said, you shall love your neighbor as what? As yourself. In John 15, 12, Jesus Christ said, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. We're, most of us today walking around the streets, we don't love each other. We don't love each other in the purity of the love of Christ. Okay? We're, too much in love by, uh, we're too much in love with ourselves. Selfish, greedy, egotistical, self-centered. Romans chapter 13, verse 9 and 10 tells us, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this same, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And I wonder how many of us, okay, actually hate ourselves because we can't seem to love our neighbor because we don't love ourselves. We're told in verse 10, love does no wrong to what? To a neighbor. There's, therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Here we go back to the law. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we're told this in verse 22. It says, since you have, since he says, you have, in, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Number three, we must conquer anger when it first arises within our hearts and our minds. And ladies and gentlemen, if you live in this country, in this culture, in this society, you will become angry. A, by not giving way to a vicious, vengeful anger. That's not your right. That's not your position. 
We're told in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Because it's the foretelling of murder to come. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're told in verse 26, 27, 28, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, on your wrath. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. B, by not allowing egotistical pride to take a foothold in our lives, for pride breeds what? Contention. It breeds anger. In the book of Proverbs, we're told this truth in verse 10. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, Proverbs 13, 10 says, Through insolence, which is pride, comes nothing but strife, nothing but headaches, nothing good. But wisdom is with those who receive counsel. Point C, by not making friends with a, lot, with a hot-tempered person, a person who is easily angered. The scripture tells you, avoid that person. That person will eventually get you in trouble, will contaminate you. He says in Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, he says, Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot-tempered man, or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. It is, let me tell you, it is, it is a profound mistake to make, and that is to go by the way of the angry man. Don't do it. Number four, we must make sure that justice is executed, that the lawless, violent, and murderers are justly punished. Uh, punished. That's the reason why we have capital punishment. That's why we have a judicial system, albeit as corrupt as it is. I understand that. I comprehend that. Don't misunderstand that I don't, that I, and, and think that I don't understand that. I do. But God has commanded man to carry out a system of justice against man for the purposes of, of fulfilling the law. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Whosoever sheds man's blood, by his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made them. So this is, what, this is where we get the first calling of capital punishment. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 21, 21 Deuteronomy 19, 21 says, Thus you shall not show pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's what it says. The scripture says, you shall not show pity. It's in other words, you must execute the terms of the law. And Exodus 21, 12 says, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. In other words, himself. Who does that? Society. That's why we have laws. That's why we have courts. That's why we have police. That's why we have, uh, that's why we have prosecutors, a judicial system, and so forth and so forth. Now, I want to look at this concept. And look at the biblical consequences of killing another person. The biblical consequences of killing another person. We see here in Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. These four words have behind them the eternal force of the one who is the author of life. That's God himself. Life is sacred. The sanctity of life has and has always will and will remain unchanged in the eyes of God. Those who break this commandment will face the righteous judge who will hold them completely accountable for murder. No murderer can escape these terrible consequences. It's not going to happen. Although we live in a cultural society today that has decided that capital punishment should be outlawed. Because it's not humane. That may be true in the eyes of a humanist, but it is not biblical. It's a divine commandment. 
Number one, the person who murders another person will suffer the wrath of God, that's for sure. We're told in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 18, Romans 1 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, look, look what it says, against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We're also told in that same book of Romans chapter 1, note what it says in verse 29. He says, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips. God is addressing this category of people and judgment will come upon them. Number two, the person who murders another person will be judged and will not inherit the kingdom of God. He will not inherit eternal life as he thinks he's going to inherit. We're told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, now the deeds of the flesh are what? They are evident, clear, a blind man can see, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the New Testament. For those who are listening to me right now and are convinced that the law is outdated, antiquated, and no longer relevant to us, such as the Ten Commandments and particularly the Sixth Commandment that we're discussing, you shall not murder. So if you feel, in fact, that that is completely antiquated, not applicable to us because we're no longer on the law, but under grace, what are you going to do with this New Testament verse? Romans 1, 18, Romans 1, 29, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, 20, and 21. What are you going to do with 1 John chapter 3, verse 15? 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a what? Is a murderer. That's what it says. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Scripture is painfully and plainly and pointingly clear. Number three, the person who kills another person is to face civil court, sentencing, imprisonment, and death penalty, or some other form of retribution. But you will face the law. In the book of Romans chapter 13, here again, New Testament, verse 3 and 4 says this, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have the praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is a evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. In Leviticus, now we go back to the Old Testament. If a man takes the life of a human being, he shall surely be what? Put to death. They had a clear understanding of this in the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, we're told in chapter 35 and verse 11, note what the scripture says there. It says, then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. So a place was reserved if there was an accidental killing. It was not murder. It was an accidental killing. But he had to go to that other city, call a city refuge, right? Because the law had to confront him. In the book of Numbers, again, look what he says in verse 19 to 25. In Numbers chapter 35, verses 19 to 25. He says, the blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. He shall put him to death, shall put him to death when he meets him. So this was a relative of a person who was killed. And if he pushed him, uh, and if he pushed him of hatred or threw something at him, lying in wait, as a result he died. Or if he struck him down with his hand in enmity, and as a result he died. Or the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity or threw something at him without lying in wait, 
And he says, Oh, with any deadly object of stone and without seeing it dropped on him so that he died while he was not, in his, was not his enemy nor seeking his injury, then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to these ordinances. So if there was an accidental killing, okay, now the congregation, the people had to make a decision. The congregation shall deliver the man slayer from the hand of the blood avenger. In other words, keep him from being killed by the family members. And the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he fled. And he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. So during this time period, there was a system of ju a judicial system in place. Number four, the person who kills another person destroys a person made in the image of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot but bring to bear the importance of this statement. You cannot destroy another life because that life has been made in the image of God. He says in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood by his blood shall be shed for the image of God he made. That's the reason why we have capital punishment. And I am not here promoting capital punishment. Don't misunderstand me. But I do know one thing. I cannot protest against capital punishment. It is a divine decree of God. Number five, the person who kills another person shows that he is defiled and has an evil heart. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 says this, and you remember earlier in our classes, we were dealing with chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, but look at what he says in verse 19 and 20, Matthew chapter 5. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders, these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So murder is birthed in the heart of man before it actually takes place. Number six, the person who murders another person causes the loss of someone's love, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a son, a daughter, or a close friend. Listen to me. Matthew chapter 2 speaks to this issue. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, 17, 18. And then when Herod saw that he had been tricked and by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem in all his vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then, no, it says, what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, and Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because there were no more. In Acts chapter 7, we're told verse 59 to 60. Then went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. He said, Lord. Do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He died. Finally, Acts chapter 8, verse 2, we're told, Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. They understood this was unjust. As we continue to look at this concept, let's look at the biblical benefits of keeping this commandment, right? that you shall not commit murder. Let's look at the benefits here of keeping this commandment. The person who obeys this commandment and does not kill another person has made a decision to do what? To value life. To value life. The contrast is stark between a culture that allows or executes the innocent and the helpless to a culture that honors and protects the sacredness of human life. Let me ask you a question. Is that the kind of culture we're living in today? Highly, highly doubtful. Those who really love and defend and protect the life, the life benefit of an entire community, a nation and world. Let me ask you a question. What are the benefits when God's people speak out against murder? What are the benefits to believers who respect the sanctity of life? Well, there's quite a number of them. Number one. The person who belongs to the Lord and respects the, and, and in addition, not only belongs to the Lord, but respects the sanctity of life. 
and will not kill, but will walk in the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. And that's us, the church, the believers. And unfortunately what happens is that the church is failing to walk in the Spirit. Because we have so many in the churches who believe, who believe in abortion, believe in suicide, believe in euthanasia. They believe in all kinds of things contrary to the Word of God. We're told in Galatians in chapter 5, verse 19 to 25, it says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are what? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, divisions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I, fore just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not do what? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the scripture says. But the fruit of the Spirit is quite different. We're told that the fruit of the Spirit is what? In verse 22, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? They have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They have it under submission, under control because they're in Christ Jesus. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. In other words, let our practice be an indication that we truly live by the Spirit. Secondly, number two, the person who follows God and respects the sanctity of life, the sanctity of life, will have a sacrificial, sacrificial love for his brother. And that's probably a telltelling sign in much of the church today because we do not love our brothers. We're told in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, 15, and 16. We know that we have passed out of death into life because what? We love the brethren. Is that true? I see much in the church, they don't love each other, they spend too much time fighting with one another and hating each other, and yet they have the audacity to sit in the church. He who does not love abides in what? In death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Number three, the person who belongs to the Lord, respects the sanctity of life, will have a great love for his friends, and willing to die if necessary. How long is your friendship? How long will it go? How far will it go? To what degree will you demonstrate your friendship? Because the book of John tells us in verse 15, verse 13, and note the powerfulness and note the audacity of the statement. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Let's return back to our lecture here, lecture number six, part two, and we continue, and let's see if we can wrap up the sixth commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder, lo tazar, a very distinct, a very specific word, which has a broad application, quite distinct from the statement that usually you find in most Bible translations, thou shall not kill. Now, we have spent a quite amount of time going through the law in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, Malachi back to Genesis. What I would like to do in this last segment here is to begin to look at this Jesus Christ and his teachings concerning murder. You shall not murder in Exodus chapter 20 verse 13. And the reason I want to do that is because, again, I go back to the same old argument that I hear all the time and that it is now an antiquated, irrelevant, no longer pertinent to us today kind of mentality and those kinds of statements. And I hear that not just from people outside the church, but from much of the church world today. 
So let's look at what does Jesus have to say with regard to this commandment, you shall not murder. And let me make this other statement also as we begin to get into the text and turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew in chapter 5. But one of the things that I want you to also note here is that Jesus Christ okay, comes to us as the fulfillment of the law. Mm -hmm. And he now we now go through everything that he says to us in the context in, of the New Testament. And you find that all Ten Commandments are restated or reaffirmed in distinct ways throughout the New Testament. Okay? And, it ha and, it's, and it's quite replete how it's restated and reaffirmed in the New Testament. The first thing we want to discuss about G the teaching of Christ is, number one, Jesus Christ declared that murder is not only an outward act, but also an attitude, an inward act, murder occurs within the hearts of men. So Jesus takes this a step further and acknowledges for us and makes it quite clear to us that murder is the manifestation of an inward attitude and inward act first. In the book of Matthew in chapter 5, this is what we read in verse 21 and 22. He says, you have heard, now Jesus is quoting now the Old Testament, the New Testament, but it's in the New Testament. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. So in other words, there is, in other words, there is the death penalty, capital punishment. That's what he's addressing here. Verse 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother, note that this, this interior attitude shall be guilty before the court and whoever says to his brother you are good for nothing shall be guilty before the supreme court and whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell so <clears throat> jesus makes it clear that you shall not murder but he goes and he takes us a step further into the recesses of our soul so what should be the believer's response to this specific teaching that Jesus Christ is giving to us. Number one, <clears throat> murder is not only an out outward act, it is also an inward act. It is born within a person's heart and mind. It is, and we've discussed this at great length in the past, A, anger, B, bitterness, C, enmity. We must never allow anger to take hold of us without just cause. And even a just cause, we must, be dis we must be disciplined in how we manifest that anger. Reconciliation is urgent while there is still time. We must not allow our relationships to sour beyond repair. We must be careful with that. <coughs> Excuse me. We must not allow our relationships to go beyond repair. Life is far too short to allow our anger to make us bitter and unforgiving. We must forgive others. Number two, anger that goes unresolved will allow a spirit of murder to enter the human heart. You need to be careful. Let, let, let me go back and say something about this issue, about forgiveness, because it really is, it, it really is important. <clears throat> I, I speak to a lot of people, and, and I hear statements like this, I cannot and I will not forgive so-and-so, so-and-so, that person, that person. No, you can forgive, you just refuse to forgive. But you cannot make the statement, I am incapable of forgiving. That's not true. And, and when you scratch the surface just a little bit deeper as to why they cannot, they've got this distorted comprehension, distor distorted understanding of what forgiveness is. They, in their heads, believe that forgiving someone means, basically, of approving what they've done, okay, or giving the license to do what they have done, that it's okay. No, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is for you. Forgiveness is for the injured party. You have to forgive. Otherwise, you will live in a birdcage 
being tortured okay, for the rest of your life. Forgiveness is what sets you free. It sets you free from the bondages of what is taking place in your life. If you don't forgive, you can no longer live. You find yourself in a state of existence. God did not call us to exist. He called us to live. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're told in verse 26, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. It will fester. It will grow. It will eat you alive. In 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, here's what the scripture says. And note what I'm, we're doing. We're focusing on the New Testament in verse 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is what? Confused? Uninformed? No. The scripture says he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that's Jesus Christ, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now, you may not be happy with your brother. You may not even like your brother. Mm -hmm. But the scripture calls us to love him and to forgive him. Matthew chapter 15, 19 says this, For out of the heart, notice this, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, and note, note this, underscore murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. Look what he says also in Mark chapter 7 verse 21, For from within, underscore, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts and fornication, thefts, murders, and adulteries. Now do you begin to see what Jesus was talking about? When he was talking about this, when he said this in Matthew chapter 5. But I also say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. He was talking about this thing inside the heart of man. This is all New Testament. Here's another teaching of Jesus Christ. Here's another issue that Jesus Christ raises with us. With regard to the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Jesus Christ declared that Satan is the source of murder. He is the source of murder and that he is the arch enemy of God and man and that he has and that he was a murderer from the very beginning. Then now Jesus Christ is making this kind of a declaration, which is why you shall not murder becomes so important for us to comprehend in the context of the New Testament since so many have decided to relegate the Old Testament as completely irrelevant to us today, which we of course we know it's not true. In John chapter 8, note what he says in verse 44. In John chapter 8, note what he says. He says, you are of your father the devil. This is what he's saying. And you want to do the desires of your father. That's Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He says, there is no truth in him. In other words, whatsoever. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So, how do we respond to what Jesus Christ is telling us? What is the response? What is the believer's response? Well, we must not reject the truth and follow in the murderous steps of Satan. Satan is a murderer in three distinct senses. I want you to note them. Number one. He was behind the first murder, okay? The man came killing his brother. This was Satan behind this. Look, go back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment and look at this with me. Cain, look at it, look what he says in Genesis 4, 8. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. The scripture teaches us that Satan was behind this. Hmm? He killed his own brother. Number two, he was behind the sin of Adam. Satan was behind the sin of Adam, which brought death to the whole human race. 
He is the murderer, the one call who caused the death of men. Do you understand that? Because of what he did, every single one of us are born to die, to be condemned throughout eternity, unless, of course, we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why he's called a murderer. Look what he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered, that's Adam, into the world, that's all of humanity, and death through sin, see death is the consequence of this sin, he says, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned in Adam, is what this verse is talking to us about. Number three, he is behind the murder of human life, and behind the loss of man experiencing real life here on earth. The devil destroys life and all abundant living when he can. He He'll destroy all of the love. He will destroy all of the joy. He will destroy all the peace. He will destroy all of the patience. He will destroy all the. He will try to destroy all of the gentleness. He will destroy all the goodness. He will destroy all of the faith. He will destroy all of the discipline. All of the meekness. This is what he does. Note what John tells us in John chapter ten, verse ten, and here is here we're receiving this instruction. Look. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the only thing that Satan comes to do. He comes to steal, he comes to kill, he comes to destroy. This is what, this is in his nature, this is what he does. And Jesus says this, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Yes, it is true that he has done all this, Satan, but it's also true what Jesus has done. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 tells us, make sure, look at verse 15, make sure that none of you, look what he says, make sure that none of you suffers as a what? As a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. In 1 John, we're also told in chapter 3, verse 15, look what he says, everyone who hates cauliflower, who hates broccoli, who hates spinach. Is that what he's talking about here? No. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You need to comprehend. You need to get this straight in your heart and your soul. I don't care where you find yourself in any part of your country or this country, because so many of us have lived in societies and cultures where we're completely divided along ethnic lines, so-called racial lines, and so forth and so forth and so forth. That person was made in the image of God, and I am not called to hate that person. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That's what he does full time. Job chapter 1. Note what Job talks about here, verse 9, 10, 11. Job. Then Satan answered the Lord in having this conversation. And Satan tries to, to, to really, really run up Okay, and challenge God. He really questions God's integrity here. And so he's in this conversation with God, Satan is, in Job chapter 1. And look what he says in verse 9. And let's take it through down to verse 11. Satan answered the Lord and said, Job, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, the reason why he loves you and obeys you is because you're protecting him. But note what he says, verse 10. Now, now, Satan attempts to accuse God of something here in verse 10. He says, have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? Don't you have this protection around him? 
and you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. And he's telling what he's done for him. Then he says, but now Jesus and God says, he says, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. So Satan now makes this challenge. Okay. Really? Because evil things happen to you, evil things happen to all of us. <clears throat> Are we to submit to the devil, to Satan himself? I don't think so. Does that give me the right as an act of rage and revenge and fury to take the life of another person? No. Third teaching. Think about this. Here's a third teaching of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ declared that some of his, some of his disciples would be murdered by family members because of their allegiance to him. This is what Jesus Christ said. <clears throat> this is Jesus Christ addressing this issue. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Look at verse 21 and 22. He says, <clears throat> and he puts it in such a direct way that it's clear hard not to understand. He says in Matthew chapter 10, he says, brother will betray brother to death. That's what it says. Family members will kill family members because of their love of Jesus Christ. He says, brother will betray brother to death and his father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated all of all because of what? Because of my name, because of Christ. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. That in spite of all of that, right, you don't have the right for revenge and taking of another life. So Jesus declares his teaching. He tells us exactly what's going to happen. So question, what should be the believer's response in light of this truth that Jesus speaks to us? Now remember, this is New Testament. Well, number one, a believer's own family can become his greatest persecutor, even his murderer. Why? Three reasons. Three distinct reasons. A, because of the believer's commitment to Christ and his righteousness. B, because of the family's orthodox religion or church. And we've seen this in different countries. Particularly, we've seen this particularly in Europe. And C, because of the believer's commitment to live for Christ, such an active witness is sometimes an embarrassment to the family. And it is horrendous to see how the family has reacted to such a stream, to such an extreme that a life has been taken. Number two, nothing hurts more than having our own family oppose us when we make a decision to follow Christ. When our families oppose and persecute us, it hurts deeply, profoundly. It is usually life scarring. In the book of John, in chapter 15, as we begin to comprehend the believer's response to this teaching of thou shall not murder, note, note, note how Jesus Christ restates this, this commandment in different ways. But what it should be the response? We see this in John chapter 15. Look with me, verse 18, 19, and 20. In John 15, 18, 19, and 20, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. So Jesus Christ makes a declaration. You're not alone. And if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world... But I chose you out of the world because of this the world hates you. Remember hate, anger is what? It's the act of murder. Remember that the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. And if they persecute me, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So Jesus Christ then says no that there is a very strong, strong possibility that we will die for our faith in him. In Luke chapter 18, 
he also makes the following statement in Luke chapter 18. Look at verse 29 and 30. Verse 29 and 30. And he said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God. And he says, who will not receive many times as much as this time and in the age to come eternal life. So what should be our response? Is that we lay down our lives for the cause of Christ. What is the fourth teaching of Jesus Christ with regard to this commandment in the New Testament? Jesus Christ declared that evil men will kill believers thinking that they are doing God a service. Let me repeat that. Jesus Christ declared that evil men will kill believers thinking that they are doing God a service. In John chapter 16, in verse 2, we read where Jesus says this, They will make you outcast from the synagogues, they will run you out of the religious institutions, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. And I've seen this in Asia, I've seen this in the Middle East, as well as in Europe, in Eastern Europe, when I've seen this in Africa, where people come, and I've seen this in Latin America, when people, they come with such zealousness, with such zeal, okay, because they're so sold out to their religion that they're willing to commit murder, and they believe that they're doing this, to give God honor and glory. And Jesus told us clearly here that this is going to happen. The inevitable becomes evitable. This becomes a reality in the life of the believer.